Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Mark Krauchuk works as a freelance producer, project manager, who leads teams of developers and creatives to make digital stuff for big companies. In his free time, Mark likes to incite street events and other creative collaborations, as well as help others with their creative projects. Hey, Mark, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Doing really well. Thank you. It's really have you, uh, really great to have you back. Well, thanks. Nice to be back. Yeah, it's been, I cannot believe it has been since 2015 <laughs> that we last had you. And uh, I, I, the, the one thing that I remember you recommending last time was like buying plastic dice in bulk, like 100 at a time, and you had some, some fun dice games and stuff. That, that was like a, a memorable tool. Well, thanks. Yeah, those are um, some of my favorite sort of tools where – they're maybe not the the most expensive tools, but they are ones that can, uh, you know, you can use over and over again. So what do you have in store for us today? Um, what other kinds of magical things are you uh, in love with these days? So the first one that I want to tell you about is um, it's called the Cricut Maker. And the Cricut Maker is a die cutting machine that you can use at home. And the story behind that for me is I was a member of Tech Shop uh, in San Francisco, and at some point uh, they closed down. And I was looking to find something that would be a good home alternative for me at uh, to replace the laser cutter because I really liked the laser cutter and I was just getting into using it. And I looked at what home laser cutters were doing, and I was like, ooh, those are quite expensive. And ooh, those can kill me if I don't vent them properly. So I looked to see like, well, what else could I get? And what came up for me was this thing called a, a Cricut Maker. There's also another competitor there is called the Silhouette. I went with a Cricut Maker. And what was so cool about this was um, it kind of looks like a printer. Um, but what it is, is it's like a plotter and then it has a little knife on it and you can put in materials um, and it can cut things out and it's mostly for scrapbookers. Um, but for me, somebody who likes to do weird, interesting projects, I've been really into it for cutting out vinyl stickers or for helping me do intricate cuts on paper. Um, it also can do cool things like, uh, engraving, uh, debossing. So you can put in, uh, things like acrylic and it can, uh, engrave acrylic it, i've used it to engrave aluminum cans wow it's really cool and it's um i feel like you know it's very accessible the price point is 400 ish dollars um that's for the maker the maker is a little bit more of a powerful machine it can cut fabric um it can do uh things like leather as well again all with knives or blades but they also have a lower cost version one that's not quite as powerful, but still cuts all the vinyl and paper, which is what I found to be the most uh, enjoyable part of it is cutting out stickers. I even figured out that I could use it to make silk screens. So what I would do is uh, instead of you know taking a screen, putting in motion and shooting it with light, all I have to do is um, cut out a vinyl, you know, a positive of what I'm looking for. And then I just put that sticker onto the silk screen, and then uh, yeah, the silk screen I can just Ooh. you know put the ink on and just start silk screening with it. Wow, so that's cool. Such... I love that. So the vinyl is like an adhesive vinyl. Yeah, and then, and then it just sticks to the actual silk fabric in the frame. Yeah, and that's like so. That's instead of the photo emulsion blocking, you're just blocking it with vinyl. Yeah, exactly. It's like a hand cut always. Yeah. Yeah. But you're that cutting it with a, cool. a machine. Can, and so can, it says you can, you were saying they can cut cloth. Have I mean, would like a, a cotton, a cloth that I could have thick as a pair of blue jeans. Would, yeah, would, would it absolutely. Cut that? 
Okay. So um, what it does is um, it has different levels of mats. So you can have a very light, uh, and all the mats have a very light adhesive on it. And so you can put on a light mat, you can put on a medium mat, or you can put it on a heavy-duty mat. And they also have a fabric mat. So this mat has sort of an optimized adhesive for fabric. And then while most of the other blades are sort of drag blades, um, for the cry cut maker, they make a circular blade that sort of rolls through the fabric. And, you know, it can also, um, for a number of the materials that it doesn't cut through the first time, things like cardboard, it can do multiple passes. I don't know if I've tried to cut, I've definitely cut leather with my uh, Cricut maker and uh, which sometimes I mispronounce as cry cut. Sorry if I do that. Um, but um, I've definitely cut out leather with it, and it worked great. Cool. And um, what's the size of the bed? What's sort of like the biggest piece you can work with? Sure. So it um, comes with 12 by 12 uh, mats, but then you can also get uh, bigger mats that are 12 by 24. So the biggest pieces that you can cut out are 12 by 24. Wow, that's 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 decent. That's really good. I mean, yeah. that's that's a bigger uh, bed than than the Glowforge, which I that? have and love. Yeah, the Glowforge, I think, is uh, I'm guessing here it's like 11 inches by like 19 and a half inches, as I recall. Um, but this one actually, also, I'm just looking. It will cut material up to 2.4 millimeters thick. That's three thirty seconds of an inch, and you can do things like chipboard. Yeah. And, and base wood. So this is like a, a, a serious tool for makers and a great alternative to a laser cutter where you, not only the cost uh, is, is too much for people, but also if you're living in an apartment or something, you have to vent that smoke. You don't have to worry about that with this, right? That's it. Exactly. Yeah. It is a uh, very uh, user friendly. Um, and then the other great thing about it is I've used all sorts of, um, other sort of cutting machines. And I've always found the software to be a little bit difficult to approach. Um, in my mind, they have made this to be extremely consumer friendly. So instead of trying to figure out like all the XY coordinates and all their depths and all your paths, it basically does a lot of that for you. You dial in what the material is um, and then it says, oh, you should put it on this sort of mat and, oh, you should secure it this way. And maybe you need to move some of the, the rolling wheels out of the way. Um, and it's just so supportive. And then the other great thing that I love about this is, you know, sometimes you get a tool and you're like, well, what do I do with it now? Um, I, oh, I wish, you know, I guess I have to go and read some books and get started. They have a program called Cricut Access. And what that is, is hundreds of projects that are just kind of ready to go. So you get to pick your own materials and you get to, you know, do some customization, but basically they have these beautiful glamor shots of these projects. And then they, you know, you go in and you download their files, you, you know, arrange them the way that you want, and then you can go. So there's basically pre-made ready, ready to made stuff so that you can learn the skills while you're actually creating something. That's really and great. If you love the project, you know, just make that. What I often do is I'll take different parts from different elements of different projects, combine them into one screen, and then make my own thing. Like um, I wanted to make a Day of the Dead skull, so I took a Halloween skull, and then I took a flower from another project so that I could make the eyes into marigolds. And it was super easy to like cut and paste between the, the, the projects. Well, that's really great. Yeah. That's fantastic. It, it's a hundred dollars a year, I think, to get to the Cricut Access. But for me, I think it's totally worth it. Can you import SVG files that you make on Adobe Illustrator? Absolutely, and the import ability of the software is um, is great. Uh, it can import it when you import something. It says, oh, "Okay, do you think that this is something that is a simple graphic, a medium graphic, or a complex graphic?" And then um, it sort of optimizes its import tool to, to bring in SVGs. Well, actually, no, that's just straight images with SVGs. It just imports it exactly as you uh, have mm -hmm. have done it. And uh, is it is it 
wired? Is it connected? Is there a kind of like Ethernet or USB connection to your computer? Uh, is it networked? Is that how you import things? Take your pick. Okay. That's kind of the beautiful thing is um, you can use the software um, either as a uh, an executable on a Mac, so it's an app on your Mac, but they also have an app for phones and iPads. And you can also go through a web browser. Cool. And then you can connect whatever your device is um, via Bluetooth. But, you know, if you're using a laptop, you can use a direct uh, USB. That's cool. Well, okay, great. I, I use my laptop and I go USB because I find it much faster. But um, if you want it to be mobile and you wanted to use this um, to cut stuff sort of on the go um, and you didn't want to break out your laptop, you could totally use your phone or your iPad. There's also a couple other interesting things that when you get a, an iPhone involved, So, you know, when you're using material, you can basically take a photo of the material on the mat and it'll import that um, photo of the material on the mat into the design software. And then you can position where the cuts are going to go on the actual material, which I thought was Mm. really novel. Mm -hmm. That's nice. You can if you have like a piece of leather with a hole in it, you could work around it or something. Exactly. So. I find that it's really good at, um, you know, helping you conserve materials. And then another cool thing that it does was um, it does this thing called print and cut. So you design it in the design software and it says, okay, print this out on your printer. You print it out on your printer. And then in addition to the graphic, it prints a big border around the whole page. And then when you put it back into the machine, you know, you put it on a mat and you put it into the machine the machine is able to find the edge of the graphics and then go and precisely cut out the image. So that's been really cool to make my own uh, printable stickers. So, you know, you can go and make a bunch of the stickers and then it cuts it out to the shape of the sticker. Instead of just being a circle or a square, it's actually like, you know, uh, the shape of the sticker. That's really, that's really fantastic. This is cool. So it's, yeah. it's $350, which is seems like a, a really great price for something that is a super powerful tool. Good one, yeah. Mark. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And so, so this, you're on a roll. What's, what's another um, one you recommend, another tool? So um, the other one, now this is, again, going to be something that is, uh, you know, it's like the dice that Mark brought up earlier. Um, it's kind of a generic tool, but for me, I think it's a a groundbreaking tool is just a, it's a, a a watch it's by Seiko and it's solar powered. And that's about the end of it in terms of technology. (laughs) What I love about it is I never have to worry about winding it. I never have to worry about shaking it. I just, you know, occasionally leave it on the, the windowsill and it charges up, but there's no even battery gauge. So I don't even know if I have to do that. I just do it every now and again. But for me, I've been trying to get away from checking my phone for the time. And because I've noticed that um, I will go and check my phone for the time, and then all of those other alerts are on there, and I immediately get sort of sucked into my phone. And so I find that, you know, if I wear a watch that doesn't have all of my alerts and all of my other stuff on it, I can just go look at the time and then stay in the moment. Uh, it's a very small, uh, you know, tweak in how one looks at the world. But to me, it's it's meant a lot. I find that it's actually quicker to look at my watch than to look at the phone. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's a great one. And and this psycho is is there a number of different ones? Is this a particularly cheap one, or wh- why the psycho? So for me, I wanted to get something that was um, sort of not something that if I, you know, lost, I would, uh, you know, be hating myself for that. But also something that I thought was going to stand up to a a fair amount of rigor. Um, And so and by rigor, I mean me messing with it and bashing against things. And so this one, I think it was around like one hundred and thirty dollars. Um, and there are other ones that comes in different configurations and date and times, but, you know, to know that I'm spending $130 on something that's going to look nice, that's going to last for a while and that I will never have to replace the battery, um, is kind of great. 
And and I should just mention that I'm, I'm looking at it here. It's it looks like a regular analog watch. The actual face of the watch is the solar panel, and you wouldn't really be able to tell that it's a solar watch. It looks just like a standard analog wristwatch. Yeah, and I think that's kind of an, an amazing thing about it is that the the face is um, a very functional part of the watch. Yeah, cool. yeah, that is really cool. Um, well, okay, so how about a third a third tool? What's what's your third pick? My third pick is mm, which one should I pick for my third pick? Um, I think the one I'm going to talk about is this um, portable generator inverter that I have. Um, I linked to one. Um, it's not the exact one I have, but it's very, very similar. And the story behind this is I do events out in the street or I will get people to do collective creative collaborations. Um, often it's, um, you know, things that we're doing in spaces that maybe we have uh, permission to be in, maybe we don't. Um, and sometimes it's nice to be able to plug something in. And I've done all sorts of interesting things to be able to get power in those situations. Um, you know, there's been things like, uh, you know, taking batteries and then, you know, rigging different circuitry to it. And, but I just wanted one that I could just plug right into. And I did some looking around and I found out that, you know, they make these little portable generator inverter boxes. And what it is, is it's an orange box. It's about, you know, a foot long by about six inches. And on one side, it's all DC plugs. And on the other side, it's all AC plugs. And you can go ahead and hook things like um, projectors. You can hook... Uh, you know, radios, uh, you can hook fans into them. And uh, without having to be connected to the wall at all, you've got basically three plugs of wall power. Now, you can't power things like irons or toasters with it. Um, I think anything above 500 watts it kind of isn't really happy with. But I've done a couple fur coat movie nights where I get people to wear fur coats and meet in, uh, you know, some outdoor parks, set up a projector, set up a stereo system, throw up a screen and I'm able to show movies wherever I want, which is kind of fun. Okay, so so the, the so this box, which has a little handle on it, you carry it around, it is a generator. I mean, that it's like it's like a gas gasoline generator is burning gasoline to generate electricity, or is it just something that you recharge charge up? Like, is it a, like a battery pack? I might it's really a big clear. battery pack. Yeah, it's called okay. a solar generator because much of solar power, you know, you want to connect your solar panel, it'll trickle charge your battery. And then you can um, tap into that battery through something else. It's that, I think that's why they call it a generator. But basically, it's a big power pack. So it doesn't make any noise. It's silent and it's light. That's good. Okay. And how, and how like if you were running a projector, how long could you run it for off of uh, you know, one charge? Oh, yeah. So I have a portable LED projector. It already has – it runs off its own batteries – and those, it's on its own batteries, it can run for about an hour. But um, what's nice is since it is kind of designed to be very low power, um, I can plug that projector into that and I can run it for four or five hours without it even, you know, uh, having any problems. Could you run a refrigerator off of this in a, an emergency? I don't think it would be big enough for that. Uh, I'm not sure how many... Uh, I'm not sure how much of a draw a refrigerator pulls, but I'm assuming that with a compressor, it probably has a pretty big draw. Right. So I wouldn't know if I would run a refrigerator off of it, but I would definitely say, could you run several people's laptops off of it? Um, absolutely. Uh, I've even used it when I've been lazy and haven't wanted to, you know, run extension cords for my sewing machines. I'll just, you know, get out the power the battery box, put it somewhere where I want to be, not necessarily where the cords want to be. I just plug stuff in and, and work from there. That's cool. And so, so I don't know if we mentioned this, but it's 260 bucks and it weighs six and a half pounds. So that's, that's not a lot, but uh, that's not a lot of weight. And the price seems pretty good as well. Another good one. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks. So um, this one's kind of intriguing to me. You wanted to talk about a, a different kind of dental floss that people might not be familiar with. Oh yeah. 
Um, so I went to my dentist and they gave me this floss and it was uh, coconut. And I was like, ooh, floss made out of coconut. That's really cool. And then I found out actually it was just um, typical uh, plastic floss that uh, was imbibed with some elements of coconut. And I thought, okay, that's that's interesting, but I wonder if there is a totally natural floss out there. And I did a little bit of digging and a little bit of research, and I found out about one called Dental Lace, and it is a silk dental floss. And um, the person who has come up with this product has really thought through everything. So it's not just that it's um, silk dental floss, but it comes in a reusable glass uh, container with a metal top, all recyclable. Um, and even all of her packaging is uh, recyclable or compostable. And um, the floss works great for me. I love it. Um, it's uh, just as good as any of the other plastic flosses I've used. And, you know, I'm not going to save the world by uh, changing my floss. But um, it is nice to say, okay, here is one thing that I can do to sort of um, reduce my amount of plastic that I've changed. And uh, it comes in a, a spool, right? So, so it's just an endless spool of it that you pull off. Like, yeah, a, I don't know how, how many yards it is. I've been using it for a little while now, and I haven't gone through my uh, first spool yet. But yeah, it just comes in a little spool. Um, it's not actually a spool. It's really interestingly, it's kind of wound in this uh, interesting shape so that it, it has its own uh, internal integrity. And you just kind of pull it all through. And then at the end, you know, you're, it's just, you know, the last piece. And then you take another sort of uh, roll of it and drop it into the glass container. And then you're off again. So, so Mark, um, you have done so many really interesting projects. I've met you at Maker Fairs and you're always uh, showing me like cool stuff that you've created. One of the things you're working on now is uh, like a, it's like you're you're calling it like DIY social media or something. Oh, yeah. You're actually using Google Docs to create like a newsletter, which is an interesting thing. Um, tell us a little bit about this uh, this method of or, or, or media that you're experimenting with. Sure. So um, I was totally addicted to social media. I love to see my numbers go up on things and have my posts liked and it was actually getting to be a little bit of a problem for me. So I was like, okay, how do I get off of social media? And um, I quit. I just stopped um, participating in it. And I was like, oh, this isn't so great. I, I miss having some sort of interaction with people. So I thought about it and I was like, well, what if I sent out a, a newsletter? And um, one of the tools I use in my job all the time is Google Docs. And I, and I love Google Docs. And so I was like, oh, well, what if I did a printed newsletter? Um, and so I went into Google Docs and I, you know, laid out sort of a front page and a back page of a threefold mailer. So uh, and on the front, I was like, oh, well, I can put all of my uh, you know, things that I would post images that I would post on one side and then sort of a longer form article on the other side. And on the back is sort of my calendar of events and all the links that I thought were cool. And so I've been doing that on a weekly basis now where I basically have been making this uh, front and back of a newsletter. And then for about, um, you know, for the majority, people are like, you know, just email it. But um, there's a bunch of people who are like, can you actually mail me a copy of your newsletter uh, once a week? And, you know, it, it doesn't always come out once a week. Uh, sometimes I've been, you know waiting for about every three or four weeks to save on a little bit of post to send it out. But yeah, um, it's been great. And because mostly what I'm doing is taking all those things that I would put on social media, taking some time to actually consider how I'm going to write about them. And then once a week, I, you know, send a little post out and it's, it's kind of great. And so, and so the way you would send it out physically was you would print a double-sided page from the Google Docs, and then you follow it up and put a stamp on it. Just, do you have a, a system for addressing them automatically as well? Yeah. So um, I, it's pretty much as you say. So what I'll do is I'll write the front of the sheet, write the back of the sheet, and then um, you know I change one parameter. I have it in um, the background image, 
the background color to be yellow. Um, that uses a lot of toner. So I actually changed that to be white. Uh, I download a PDF. I print out the PDF front and back in color on a color printer. And then, yeah, I, uh, three folds, a uh, little bit of tape on each corner, and then a stamp on uh, you know, the, the back. And the one quarter of the, uh, the way I've designed it is, or one third of the back is actually you know, the return address and where I want to put the stamp. And then I use uh, pages to actually use the Avery labels to print out uh, all my addresses. And then, yeah, I just manually spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes addressing uh, and folding them up and sending them out. I've also realized that uh, you only get one ounce of uh, mail for each stamp. So I save a little bit by not using an envelope and just, you know, making it sort of fold up to a trifold. And then uh, if I am not so good about my mailing, you uh, buy an extra ounce stamp and you can send eight pages um, for without having to get a second stamp. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. And, and, and some people just get a PDF version of this, which would have the links being active. Yeah, exactly. That's one of the fun things about sending out a newsletter in the age of links. Uh, is I have to decide what things do I want to highlight and sort of embed the link and what things do I want to actually spell the link out for so when people actually get the print version, they can, they can get to it. Mark, Mark, here's a suggestion that something that uh, we've been doing with our print publications is you can print out tiny, tiny QR codes that will uh, send, send the uh, URL so that it loads up on your device's browser for for a print a print version. Yeah. Ooh, that's good. I'll have to look into into that more. Right, because most phones now will recognize a QR code even without an app, just natively. Yeah, that's pretty I, I great. I recommend checking it out. Um, but anyway, Mark, this has been great. Uh, we could have talked a lot more about other things, but I think that you know people should go to uh, markkrauchuk dot com and. Uh, and crowdcheckindustries.com and then they can really kind of get a feel for the, all the really cool stuff that you're that you're working on you're a very interesting person and i think people would uh, it would be a, a rewarding use of their time to, to go check those things out well thanks mark i appreciate you saying that and and you might also do a little tutorial on how you you know kind of hacked uh, you know, google docs to make it look so so cool. Um, looking at your newsletters, it's um, miss, most people kind of associate Google Docs with a very generic, bland, you know, almost like ASCII text. But you have this is it's almost like in design. Oh well, thanks. Um, and and, and how, are there tutorials on how to to use this? I didn't even know that the Google Docs could do this. Um, you know, I. Uh, have been working in sort of this word processing world for a while. So I just went in and added some tables and uh, I changed the background color. And, you know, it's really interesting how you can import images. And so I, I think I mostly just sort of uh, did what every good maker does is just, you know, I went in and played a bunch and uh, brought in other uh, knowledge, but it's a good idea. Maybe I should do a tutorial on how I do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think like a, a YouTube video, that's just, a, you know, a screen uh, yeah. screencast of how you right. format the pages. That would be really interesting. I think a lot of people could benefit from that. Ooh, okay. I love that sort of suggestion. I will totally uh, figure out. Yeah, yeah. That. No, because I'm, I'm very impressed by um, the polish that this looks like for a Google Doc. And a lot of people don't have access to the Adobe products because they're so expensive. But it's very clear you don't need to. Um, you could just use Google Docs, and here's how here's how you can do it. Well, thanks. Well, Mark, this has been great again, uh, and hopefully it won't be uh, another four years between uh, having you return. Well, thank you. I look forward to uh, uh, you know exploring the world and bringing back what I find. Hey, everybody, it's your co-host Mark, and I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more going on here in Cool Tools than just this podcast. We have our flagship website where we review a new tool every day. That's at cool-tools.org. 
We also have four different newsletters. We have this podcast. We have a YouTube channel where we review tools. And if you like what you hear and see and read, the best way to help us out is by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cool tools and donate at any level you wish. You can even contribute $1 a month, and, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that you give us will go towards paying for our transcribing costs, editing videos, and editing the podcast. It goes towards paying contributors who write the reviews for us. It goes towards our equipment costs, our hosting costs, and it supports our very small company of three people. This week, I wanted to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters who have been giving us at least $2 a month. And if you give us $2 a month, we'll give you a shout out online. And this week, I would like to thank Michael Sakochia, Molly Starr, M. Velderman, Opposable Thumbs, Pamela Cooley, Patrick Weyer, Paul Hosey, Randy Fisher, Stuart Burroughs Brand, Synaptic Sam, Therese Schwartz, Tom Hawkins, Tom Markham, What Bear, Javier Pangolin, David Lang, Eric Byers, Sean Hartley, Stephen Powell, Greg Lichtscheidt, John Hobson, Adam Bristol, Adam Naher, Anonymous, Bill Kempthorne, Bruce I. Niles, Chris Woodruff, C. Kolos, Daryl Flynn, Egg Fliegoff, Eric Hanschrau, Eric Hoover, Godfrey Saldana, Jay Skiles, John M. Larson, Jude Galligan, Kenneth Gilman, and Lucas Frank. Thank you very much for supporting the show, and we will see you next week.